I always worry a little bit about Wallace. He always seems to half trip going down that step. And I'm just worried one of these times I'm going to just look over and instead of catching himself being cool, it's just going to be a So, and that'd be very distracting. Oh, wait, 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 wait. He could get hurt. He could get hurt. And, and it would be very distracting. But, um, so the primary announcement is that there's not a lot to announce uh, the event planner is not here to plan events, to announce. And so um, those of you that are signed up for the Bible study, I believe started getting your, your texts and your notes and stuff. Man, my wife, she's funny. She loves the word, man. She's up every morning just digging in. And so uh, you should start getting that. We actually aren't totally for certain right now when she'll be back to start the class part. So I told her, I said, baby, you just don't worry. These are all seasoned adults in Christ. They will study the word for themselves. They'll have rapturous revelation and then tell you about it when you get back. So, so one of my favorite people is here. Amanda, how are you? It's good to see you. When, when people move away, Wyoming's a funny place because we don't have that many crossroads, you know, like with gas stations and stuff. And the other day I ran into Levi just randomly at a gas station in the middle of nowhere. I turned around from getting my coffee and he was standing there looking at me. And I was like, all the truck drivers know where the good coffee is. Praise God. So that worked out pretty good. It's great to see you. So um, we're going to try to continue through the fifth chapter of the book of 2 Corinthians. I was attempting last week to start a message series called Great Chapters of the New Testament. And instead of getting through, we got to preaching happy about glory and, and going to heaven and all of that stuff. So we only made it through about, I don't know, nine verses or so. And so um, instead of falsely advertising that I will finish the chapter today, instead I'll say something honest. Let's see how far we get. So if you want to stand with me for the reading of the Word of God, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and beginning in verse 9. And we'll read a few verses together. If you're visiting, this is just our custom out of respect for God's word before we start. So, verse 9. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, I love that, and also trust are well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but to give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. So verse 12 is probably not underlined in your Bible. People don't preach about that one but we're going to today, so just make note. Verse 13, if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. If we are of sound mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Wow. So let's read 14 and 15 out loud together. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Father, would you just open your word to us, give us that sweet spirit of revelation that we rely upon that we have maybe more than just a religious gathering this morning, but that we would see receive revelation in our spirit. That's what we need. That's what we look for. That's what we ask for. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. You can be seated this morning. So if you were here last week, I told you that we... Um, the beginning of the chapter, 
speaks of putting off this tent and acquiring our heavenly home. Our friend Rick chose to punctuate my sermon by going on to his heavenly home. So last week, we had a good time just getting hung up in the fact, with the fact that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That the moment you're done here, you're there. You close your eyes here looking at whatever, you know, depending on how your life goes is how you think about these things, right? And so, so for example, as a truck driver, I have thought before on many a snowy, icy mountain pass that I would see the nose of the truck go through the guardrail. Then I would see the trees coming up to meet me. Probably have a minute to say, Lord, <laughs> the last thing I would see is the windshield, and the next thing I would see would be Jesus. Boy, why didn't you turn? <laughs> Son, you had to turn. <laughs> I was trying, but it was slick. You were going too fast. I know, but I'm here now, so where's my house? Amen. When I'm done here, I'm there. And this is the context. This is how Paul's, and this is why, as unexciting as it sounds, we're going to be looking at these great chapters in the Bible because I am persuaded that one of my jobs as your pastor is to help you be grounded in the actual truth and not the internet truth. Because what I see happening all over the body is we take one verse, totally out of context, make a meme about it, spread it all over the place, and people who don't know any word are making doctrine for their life out of one verse that is taken out of context. What we find when we put the famous verses back in context is that sometimes they are as good as we thought, and sometimes they don't even say what we were told. And so putting them in context is important. And so that's, that's why we're doing this. And we just came past one, but that context matters. So this is the th flow of thought in verse 9 when Paul says, Therefore, therefore, I get no makeups. I don't get any do-overs. The moment I'm done here, I'm there. Therefore, I make it my aim. Greek, my goal, my priority whether I'm here or there, to be well-pleasing to everyone. That's not what he said, is it? See, I caught some of you right there. You're like, amen. No, that's not what he said. He said, if I know what appointment I've got coming, then if I make a priority, it's out of pleasing him. Everybody just say, living to please Jesus. See, this is the thing that has gotten so twisted up in our Western culture. The whole culture right now will tell me that my job is to make sure they feel good. Even though I have no idea their background, their context, their issue, anything that happened in their life, I'm supposed to stand and tread lightly because my job is to make them feel good. And yet the Word of God does not support this. The Word of God tells us to walk in love. The Word of God tells us to walk in compassion. The Word of God tells us to walk with a tender heart and a gentle spirit. Absolutely. But when it comes to who to please, the Scripture is plain. Whether you are here or there, you make your aim pleasing Him. And he goes on to explain why in verse 10. For we're going to appear before the judgment seat of the Republican Party. No, see, this is the thing. My appointment is with Jesus. This is why it matters so much what I do with his word. Because my appointment is with the author. I don't get to play with it, shred it, tear it up, and then get there and go, hey, you understand, it's all good, right? No, that's not how that works. We all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now let's talk about something this verse is referencing. We must all appear. Paul is writing to the Christians. So the judgment seat of Christ is not a reference to whether or not you're getting into heaven or not. The judgment seat of Christ, and he explains, where we may receive the things done in the body according to what was done, whether good or bad. 
Everybody just say good or bad. Now, who do you think gets to define whether it was good or bad? Probably him, right? Because he's the one we have the appointment with. So it doesn't really matter so much whether grandma told me it was good. It matters more whether Jesus will say that was good, right? So our appointment is with him. Now, Paul in another place in, in Corinthians earlier, he's referenced the fact of how this actually happens. Earlier in 2 Corinthians, he talks about the fire of God's presence will prove each man's work. So basically, he says, all of the fleshy stuff, the temporary stuff, he referenced it as being like wood and hay and stubble will just burn. All of the eternal stuff, the, the God stuff, the kingdom stuff, much like a precious uh, gem or metals that can survive a fire, survives, and this becomes the reward of the person who, who arrives. And he's trying to get us to understand that each day as we live this life, we are either stacking up more hay or stacking up more gold. Okay? We, we are either stacking up more that's just going to vanish or we are planting ahead things that will survive. The, the, the bad is not so much the religious idea. Oh, it was bad to see that movie. It was, it was bad to say that word. No, no, no. What he's talking about, bad from the perspective of eternity. Why would it be bad? Because it's a waste. See, the things I do for eternity, they last. The things I do for the moment are a waste. So Paul is saying, make good use of your life. Do what's eternal. Because if you just waste your time doing what's temporary and what feels good and what makes your neighbor happy, that'll, all, that'll get you the key to the city on this side. But there, it'll just be burnt as something that was not eternal at all. And earlier, he, he describes it. He says, that person's not, we're not talking salvation. They're saved. But he makes a statement that should scare people living in the flesh because he says, they're saved, all right, but as somebody who's passing through a fervent heat. So you got people all over the place, their faith, yes, they're trusting Jesus for their salvation. And then they're living for themselves. Every decision is temporal. Every decision is what feels good, what sounds good, what people like, what people approve of. Chasing all their reward is here. All their goals are here. All their priorities are here. And we look and we watch them and we go, you go. That guy's successful. She's doing great. He's going to be the top of that industry. She's going to rock the whole world. And Paul is giving us an insight into an appointment with Jesus. They could cause the most famous and well-known person on the earth to have nothing but ashes and pass into eternity with no reward at all because everything they did, they did for them. Mm. Everything they did was temporary. Everything they did was here and didn't have an eternal mind. Everything they did was to please them or somebody else rather than him. And so Paul is giving us insight. He's telling these people, you don't like everything I preach, but I'm not preaching to you. Oh, see, could we go ahead and go for it? You don't like everything I'm teaching you, but I'm not teaching just you. In the back row of the church, Jesus is sitting there watching. I preach until he nods and says amen. This is not about you. I hope you like what I'm doing on the way, but my appointment is with him. I share the gospel with my neighbor and I make him mad, but it's not about him, it's about Jesus. Not going to get there and find out why were you too timid, why were you too nervous, why wouldn't you say something, why wouldn't you hold out the words of life? Well, he might have not liked it. <laughs> no, see, we're all going to get there and the priorities of this life are going to be exposed. Now, see, in this moment, right this moment, you go... Okay, and this is why people don't preach this. This is why people on TV don't preach this. This is why people with big churches don't preach this. You know, Walt, we'd have a big church if you just shut up about this stuff that's spooky. Yeah, but see, I'm not preaching for that. Because some brothers with big churches are going to have nothing 
while they were tickling ears and playing games and trying to get elected mayor of the city, were supposed to be having an eternal perspective. I would much rather arrive at heaven's gate with all 50 of us in tow than arrive at heaven's gate and here I had 2,000 and there I have 100. No, the fact is, brothers and sisters, we're supposed to be living for eternity whether it's the popular thing to do or not. Because we have an appointment with Jesus. Now, in verse 11, he uses a word nobody likes in our current, you know, soft culture. Verse 11, he said, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Man, the terror of the Lord. All over the body of Christ right now, man, I can hear it. I can hear it. Big name, big gene preachers with Lamborghinis. That's not what, that ain't the word, that ain't the word, that ain't the word. Blessing, bags of money. Get a sports car. I think it's in there. I'm looking right at it. Therefore, the terror of the Lord. Everybody just say the terror of the Lord. Now, the wording, the the structure of that in the New King James is not misleading, but in our, the way we talk now, we could be thrown off. The idea is not you're so terrified of God you can't move. Now, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but the fear that the Scripture is speaking about is having reverence, respect, understanding who he is. What he's talking about when he says, therefore, the terror of the Lord, New Living Translation rendered it knowing our fearful responsibility to God. Right? What is the terror part? That if they die without him, they are lost forever. And the church has been given a fearful responsibility to preach the gospel. Not blessings, not get healthy, not get rich. The gospel. The church has been entrusted with a fearful responsibility. Tell the entire world that my son paid for their sin and he is the only way that their sin can be covered. Tell the world. Father, they don't want to hear it anymore. Tell them anyways. This is a responsibility that I have entrusted to the church and knowing the terror of the Lord. Are you doing okay? Am I teaching you anything this morning? Let me give you a piece of trivia that most people don't know. Jesus taught on hell nine different times. He spoke of heaven twice. But here's the interesting thing. He never preached hell to the crowd He taught it to his disciples so that they would understand the magnitude of the mission. So when old preachers took it wrong, we'll tell everyone how lost they are. We'll preach hell so hot they're scared and run to the front. They missed something. Jesus wasn't trying to scare people into following him. He was trying to scare the disciples about the consequences if people didn't follow him. And Paul says it plainly. Therefore, because we know the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Everybody just say the word persuade. See, the way that it would have gone 50 years ago is therefore knowing the terror of the Lord, we terrorize men. Because we know the terror of the Lord, we scare men with stories of flames and demons and torment. Paul said, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Because I know the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. And he makes a reference in verse 12 to being so beside himself about it, sometimes he doesn't even look right. If I'm beside myself, you think I'm losing my mind. I'm not losing anything. I just know where you're headed and you don't. I just know that you are blind and headed for destruction and you don't. And so I plead with you as somebody who sees a danger ahead for you that you don't even see. If I didn't love you, it'd be easy. I'd stand here and wave and tell you to go to hell, but I can't because I know the terror of the Lord. And so I seek to persuade you. I pray. I walk the house at night. I pour oil on your pillow and plead the blood of Jesus because I know what's ahead for you if you don't have him. And you think I'm just out of my head. 
And I'm just hoping you make something of yourself that looks like a decision to follow Jesus. Because there's no other way. Verse 12, like I said, no one preaches on this. No one. But that's why you're here, right? Because we preach about things at Wellsprings nobody else will even touch. Verse 12 is interesting. Paul says, we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance, not in heart. Let me give you some insight and help you. Paul was having a problem that we probably don't know that much about, so let me, let me bring you up to speed. He had planted the church. He had preached the gospel there for a year and a half. He had rebuked the demons. He had stood up to the powers of darkness. He had seen the sick healed. He had seen the dead raised. And then he had gone on. Then some people came in behind him who had done none of that stuff. When there was already a church there and started bragging. Look how many people come to church here. Now, see, we don't know anything about that today, but what, this is what he was dealing with. Look how big the congregation is. Look how many people here in Corinth come to church. Isn't that fantastic? They had nothing to do with it. They weren't willing to go there when it was full of idols. But now that it was established, hey, I'm the pastor of this Look at this awesome thing that I have done. And I know we can't possibly imagine people that would boast in appearance. We have no idea what that would look like. That the boasting would be based in how it looks. We No, right? We don't have any idea what that would be like. For somebody to establish that they're anointed because of how it looks. For somebody to establish that their doctrine's correct because of how it looks. No, we, oh, wait a minute. Maybe we've arrived at something that's absolutely happening all around us right now. You can preach any error you want in America right now as long as you've got a big building and a cool band. Preach anything you want. People just sit back and go, it's got to be right. Look how big it is. It's got to be correct. Well, there's like 14 scriptures that he ignored. Oh, I know, but look how beautiful it is. It's got to be God. I mean, come on. A whole crew of people wouldn't follow him if he was wrong. Ever heard of the Branch Davidians? Those folks thought a guy with glasses was Jesus. Figure that out. The one that healed the blind, remember? Catch up. You're slow, but you're worth it. Why would Jesus need glasses? <laughs> Somebody at that Branch Davidian thing should have gone, wait a minute, whoa, 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 Jesus. Why can't you see? Somebody should have asked. No, people follow things all the time. There was a big crowd last time I went to a concert. Doesn't mean I'd take life advice from the person singing. No, what's got to happen here is an understanding that what Christ has done is the center of this. And that's where we stay. That's the narrow road that leads to life. And Jesus said it's a broad path leading to destruction and said there's a crowd on it. Many go that way. And so you've got to guard your own heart against people that would just brag in what it looks like. Paul's saying right now, I don't look like nothing, and yet I'm the one who built that. So I'm trying to give you guys some opportunity when they come bragging in appearance I want you to be able to have a response that has to do with the heart did you see that who boasts in appearance and not in heart Paul said look New Testament if you're following Jesus what's going on in your heart is more important than what's going on in your pocketbook oh come on somebody you can get sleepy on me if you want to but understand the Bible this is the New Testament where God lives inside your soul and has taken up residency in your heart and your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. It matters more what's happening in your heart than what's happening with the car you drive, the house you live in, or how many buddies you've got on social media. God says, I weigh the heart of a man. 
not the checking account. Paul said, yeah, they're coming around and bragging, but they got no heart. You ever met anybody with no heart? <laughs> they're funny, aren't they? They'll tell you everything about what you ought to be doing. And the whole time you're like, man, you got no heart, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. You said, this, is, this is this deep right now because it just has to look like something. <laughs> you doing all right? Am I wearing you out? Um, I had a funny conversation with a couple of worship leaders a few weeks back. They'd had a big event. And the one guy said, oh, man, the glory of God fell. And me just being me, I said, really? That's fantastic. I'm, I'm surprised I didn't hear about it. He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, tell me what happened. I mean, how do you know the glory of God fell? And he says, starts saying stuff like, oh, you'd never seen so many people sing. Well, okay, but get to the glory part. Oh, no, man, there wasn't, there wasn't a hand not in the air. Okay, but, but get to the glory part. You're telling me the glory of God fell? Based in what? Well, because Pipsqueak doesn't know enough word. Oh, come on. I know you're all getting nervous, but we got to get in the book. I said, who was convicted of their sin? Oh, well, it wasn't really about that. Okay, yeah, but when the glory of God comes, there is a conviction of sin. That's in the book. Who wound up turning their life around? Well, we didn't really give opportunity for that. The focus of the meeting was more refreshing. Okay, then don't tell me the glory came. Or somebody will turn their life around whether you give them an opportunity to or not. Who died? He said, what? I said, well, in the Bible, when the glory of God comes down, people with lying, divided hearts die. This is America. When we wonder why the glory doesn't fall, because we'd be in some trouble. Right now, there's too much junk in the camp, man. God's glory fall in the average church. We go to from 100 to 6. We'd all be there. Death by glory. <laughs> Lord, why'd you do that? Well, you kept singing that song telling me to show up. And No, see, scripturally, this is not just words. The glory of God is the weight of his presence, man. You want to know what tests every work in my life when I get there? Just his presence. What did Paul say in a different place? For our God is the consuming fire. It's the presence of God that will refine everything in your life. If you want to have a profound time, take a whole weekend, throw your phone away, and seek the face of God until the glory of the Lord shows up where you're at, and he'll straighten up all kinds of stuff in your life. It's very clarifying to get alone with the one who's the truth. No, we're just throwing words around. It's the glory because everybody sang. I said, well, man, I'm right back to it then. I saw the glory bust out at Adele. Man. I mean, that was the glory. Everybody singing rolling in the deep, man. That had to be the glory of the Lord, right? Because everybody was singing. Were, were, were their hands up? Yeah, actually. Oh, well, no, but that's different. No, you're just being foolish. Look, I'm glad when everybody sings. I think it's fantastic. But this is not about what things look like. This is about the heart behind it. I've seen God move in more power in a tiny little gathering underneath somebody's carport with an acoustic guitar that's out of tune and nine strung out looking people that can't hardly hold it together. But in their heart, they mean it. And it's real, and it's worship in spirit and in truth. And you can get the Holy Spirit to do more in that carport than in the average sanctuary in this country where everybody shows up to pretend they're something that they're not. God doesn't anoint lies. He doesn't anoint who you pretend to be. He'll only anoint who you really are, David. You can't be pretending to be Saul and walk in the power of God for your life. 
You're going to have to strip that junk off and stop acting and trust his love enough to just be who you are. And then you find the power of God because he's the spirit of truth. I'm preaching better than some of you are catching it this morning, but that's okay. If I go on my drive this week and I check out and go through that guardrail and watch them trees come up, I'm going to stand before the Lord and he's going to say, that was a good sermon on Sunday, son. Because I'm living to please him. Hope you all remember it and send an offering to my wife. Amen. Let's wrap this up. Too much for you right now. Too much. Look at verse 14. We read it out loud. For the love of Christ compels us, drives us. That's the motivator. The love of Christ. Everybody say the love of Christ. This is why you can't get too far from the cross. You can't get too far from what Christ has done or you'll lose your drive. It's the love of Christ that compels, drives, motivates. If Jesus can drag that, that cross through that street, if he can endure, if he can be nailed to a cross and still be praying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The love of Christ compels. I can survive what you did to me because it's not anything like what was done to him. It's the love of Jesus that keeps us moving, and he says it compels us because we've made a judgment. Everybody just say judge. We're good at that one, amen? I got an old friend in Florida. We're joking about writing a book together. We're going to call it The New Spiritual Gifts of the Modern Western Church. <laughs> I wanted to call it what in the world happened to all the spirit-filled saints? But he thought that was a little too, he wants to bait people in a little bit. We're going to talk about, if we do it, our plan is to talk about the nine actual gifts of the spirit and then contrast them with what we have now. Where, where the Holy Spirit said that he would give us discernment, now everybody's walking around judging everything. I wouldn't do this, and I wouldn't do that, and that's stupid. Mirror never going to run in their mouth and spewing stuff all over the place. Paul's saying, I made a judgment, but it was, it was a good one. My whole life I've been preaching, teaching, and doing stuff, and Paul says, I did make a judgment about something. Let's look what he judged. That if one died for all, then all died. Right? So if Jesus had to die for all of us, it means we're all already dead. Are you doing all right? You know, it's really interesting to find out that the New Testament never argues you're a bad person. It argues you're dead. That's two different things. See, when the church started doing clothesline preaching, like, your problem is your tattoo. That's what's wrong. If you didn't have a tattoo, if you didn't have the, if you didn't have your parent, just shut up. None of that matters. The issue is with Christ, you're alive, and without him, you're dead. The argument's not who's good or bad. The argument is, are you alive or dead? So Paul says, look, I figured something out. If one guy had to die for all, it's because we were all dead. Good conclusion, brother. But then verse 15 hits us square in the face. He died for all that those who do live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Who are you living for? Is the most important question any Christian can ask themselves at the beginning of any day. Who is this day for? Is it for him? Or is it for me? Is it for Jesus? Or is it for what everyone expects? Am I really living for him, or am I just asking him to bless what I want? See how quiet it got? It's terrible, isn't it? I have to coach you through it, like I told you the other week. That's conviction. That's healthy. Don't go to lunch and be mad at me. Go to lunch and thank God you're in a place where the Holy Spirit can still convict us. Because, see, there's a horribly false gospel running around in America 
All God wants to do is give you what you want. It's all over the place. It's big money right now. Ever had a dream? Yeah. God wants to give you your dream. Well, is there something that you want? Oh, yeah. I got a whole list. Those are called goals, and God wants to give you all your goals. Cool. I've got a partner in what I want? And you do good unless you read the Bible. If you want to do that stuff, then my prescription would be just don't read the Bible. Because as soon as you really read it, you run into stuff like this. This isn't even supposed to be about you anymore. See, the modern American gospel is God wants you to have what you want. And the Bible gospel is God wants you to die to what you wanted and for you to want what he wants. The New Testament gospel is that the only person who has desires that count is Jesus. And we go, what? No, wait a minute. No, no, the other guy. I watch this guy online every week. And he told me that the new word from the Lord was that I could have all the stuff that I want. Then keep watching. I'll wait. But I'm going to stand over here in the Bible. What's supposed to happen is that because one has died for all, we look at that example. He died for nothing he wanted. He died for nothing he did. The only innocent man who ever walked the earth, taking the place of the guilty, completely emptying himself so that you and I could live. And I'm supposed to believe that the right response to that is awesome. Now I get what I want. No, it's a false gospel. It is a man centered, twisted, unbiblical, false gospel. Well, Walt, you're not giving any wiggle room there at all. I can do you one better. It's inspired by demons puked out of hell. I could keep going, but you're already bothered because you think I'm judging. But I'm okay because I'm judging what Paul judged, so I feel pretty safe. Jesus didn't die so that we could all have stuff we want and pursue our goals and do what we want. He has this crazy idea that dying for our sins and purchasing our lives means that we will serve him. And he says little inconvenient things like, you want to live? Yeah, Jesus. If you lose your life, you will find it. Do you want to follow me? Yeah, we'd like to. Then pick up your cross. Deny yourself and come and follow me. Well, can I go bury my dad first? No. And we go, what? Jesus would never be like that. He was like that. Read the book. Read his resume. He said compassionate things like let the dead bury them. You come follow me. Because if you want to see them again, the path is following me. Now see, we want this to be so watered down and it gets so silly and kind of like plain oatmeal. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You ever had good oatmeal? You know, butter, brown sugar, cinnamon all in it. Apple pieces or something, like crunchy good stuff, man, caramel thrown in, come on. And then you get, no, no, no. Heart healthy oatmeal is this plain stuff that looks like you could patch sheetrock with it. <laughs> this, I'm supposed to eat this. That's the good stuff. Oh, okay. Sticks to the roof of your mouth. Feels like that stuff they use to patch up when they fix dental stuff. And that's supposed to be good for you. See, what happens in the church, we just keep watering this down. Jesus goes from being a conquering king to just a savior. Another generation later, he's a buddy. Now he's a friend. 
Now he's a confidant. He's a business partner. We just keep watering it down. It's just like that plain nasty oatmeal. We wonder why people lose interest in what the church is preaching because now we're preaching Jesus just wants to be your friend. Well, I have friends. So then it becomes, well, so what? Why, I, then I don't need him. I don't need another friend. Look at my Facebook profile. I have 3,000 friends. And 200 of them I know. And, and I got lots of friends. I don't need another friend. And that's why he's optional to them. Who cares? I've been told self-help my whole life, so I don't need a buddy to help me achieve my dreams. I can do that on my own. So you keep that church stuff. But if somebody begins to understand, there's a God who made everything by talking to it. I'd like some light. Wow. That's good. I think I'd like some stars. That's good, too. He's awesome. And my appointment's with him. And I don't need a business partner. I need a savior. You know why? Because he's holy and eternal and pure and awesome, and I'm a scumbag. Because somebody taught me the word right. That the fact that I lie when I'm in trouble doesn't make me unfortunate. It makes me a liar. The fact that I stepped out on my wife doesn't mean I was trading up or being cool. It means I'm an adulterer that committed fornication. I heard the word of God and somebody showed me that when I take anything that doesn't belong to me, it doesn't mean I was disadvantaged and unfortunate. It makes me a thief. And I'm going to stand before a holy God. In that moment, none of my stuff is going to work. I need a Savior. And about the time I go, I need one, Jesus goes, hey, covered it. What you need is me. Because I'm the only one that can give you standing with him. That's the gospel. And Americans are buying into this silly stuff. Can't afford it, brothers. We can't. We can't. I'm not going to judge anything on appearance. Let's walk in pure judgment of the heart. Whether or not you're awesome has nothing to do with how much money you have. It has to do with how you love people. Whether or not you care about people that are broken. Whether or not you'll take the time to sit down with somebody and tell them your testimony. Even if it's ugly. Some church people only want to tell it once they fix it. Sometimes you got to sit with somebody and tell them the ugly. What's going on with you? Well, I was thinking about killing myself tonight. Been there. When? Yesterday. You go, well, I'm not admitting that to anybody. That's why we're not reaching them. Because we're pretending. We're pretending. We've been given a fearsome responsibility and all the power of heaven to get it done. All we have to decide to do is live for him instead of us. And we can make it happen. Now, I'm telling you the truth in Jesus. It probably sounds commonly around here like I don't like television preachers and internet preachers. It probably... You may be picking up on like, hmm, I think it's possible Walt has an issue with television preachers and internet preachers. I do. Huge one, actually. And here's what it is for you. You don't know them. You know what it looks like. And that's not enough. That's not enough. And that's why every time they fall into scandal, we're all stunned. How could it have happened? He was so anointed. Apparently not. 
they found him in the car with the prostitute. That's probably a hint that while he looked good, the heart was wrong. And I want to tell you something funny about how uh, incompatible the truth is with modern charismatic Christians. And then I will quit. I've given you too much. You have your plate is full right now. You're just like a little kid at a thing. Yeah, yeah. A friend of mine sends me a video of a prophet. Of course. And uh, man, since these prophets got my email address, good Lord. I, I get 20 words a day. It's like, let's just stop, <laughs> please, just stop. But friend sends me this video. Hey, man, check this out. I'm like, okay. I like my friend, so I click on it. So here the guy is, right? He's got his phone. He's recording himself, and he's in the airport. You know, he's traveling. He's a big deal. So he's in the airport with his phone, and he's preaching into his phone. Got a word from the Lord for everybody. Wanted to make sure you all heard it. <laughs> Crashing into people. I want you to understand. Now, first of all, I'm thinking to myself, stop ticking people off and go off to the side. Why would you just make everybody, well, because you're important. I get it. So you got your phone, and he's preaching, and he gives this prophecy. You know, no more delay. Heaven is canceling the idea of waiting. Now stuff's just going to happen. So whatever you've been believing for, it's just going to happen. So you don't have to wait anymore. You forget about patience. Patience was a gift for yesterday. There's a whole new wave coming, and it's going to be happening, man, right now, so fast you won't even be. So I, I watched it. I went, okay, wow, cool. So what I wanted to know, so I start scrolling what are the comments, right? Like, what are, what are people saying about this? Bunch of stupid people. Fire emojis. Oh, amen. Praise the Lord. Jesus is awesome. Revival's on the horizon. Double amen to that, bro. Shared this so I'd be blessed. You know, just stupid. So I thought, let's see what happens if somebody puts truth. No, no, I wasn't mean. I was not mean. Look at your faces. I didn't pick on anybody. I was not mean. I was not mean. I put the scripture from Matthew where Jesus said, beware the false prophet. You will know them by their fruit. And all I said was, how am I supposed to know what to do with this? I don't know this man's life. He's a face on my cell phone. And the only way Jesus gave me to know was to know his life, his character, his fruit. So what am I supposed to do with this? How am I supposed to know whether to believe this or not? I don't know this guy wandering through an airport talking on his phone. Everybody wanders through the airport talking on their phone. So all of you gave double thumbs up and praise the Lord to this word. It must be because you all personally know him and know his fruit. Guess who became the false prophet in that thread? Somehow it was me. Yeah. Just so you know, God was going to kill me for that yesterday. Somehow here I am. Why? Because I'm standing in the truth, and I've forgotten more scripture than these neophytes know. And I don't care. They can be upset with me if they want to. But at some point, we have got to get in the word instead of chasing all this foolish stuff. All I asked was a biblical question. Does anybody know this guy? Do we know if he's kind? Because that's fruit. Do we know if he's gentle? Do we know if he's good with his children? Do we know if he walks in patience? Do we have any idea if he knows what long-suffering looks like? Because that's fruit. 
What Jesus was trying to say is if the Holy Spirit is not enough of an influence in your life to make you nice, he's not enough of an influence to give you a prophecy. It's not deep. If you're so anointed you can't be nice, I don't need to know you. And you are smeared with something, which is what anointing means, but it's not what you think. No, the fact is, brothers, we got to get in the Word. And not only are people not in the Word, they get mad at the Word. That's what amazed me. One guy under there said, wow, y'all piling on, brother. All he gave you was a scripture. One guy came to my defense in this whole thing. Why are you piling on this guy? All he gave you was a scripture. If your boy's a true prophet, you shouldn't have a problem with scripture. Oh, you guys are just old wineskins that can't receive the new move of God. Happily. That's fine. I will go ahead and miss that train. That's fine. That one can go right on by. You ever seen that scene in New York, like in a movie, and they're standing there talking, and the subway just (laughs) goes, I'm fine. Rock right on. You go with your bad self. Pour the speed to it. Crank up the throttle. Head toward the curve. I'm good. I will stand right here in the middle of the word of God and trust Jesus. And they can call me a dinosaur if they want to. I don't care. Dinosaurs lived a good long time. That's fine. And if a dinosaur showed up now, you wouldn't say nothing except where to get out of the way. It's not a bad thing to be a dinosaur. They're kind of awesome. You ever seen Jurassic World? How many have seen it? Any of you guys? They have the big pool, right? They got the swimming dinosaur, and they put the bait out over the water, and that gigantic thing, right? Computer graphics now, isn't it amazing? That gigantic thing came out and bites that hole. It's like a cow or something. I forget what it even was. Takes the whole thing. Elijah knows. The shark, see? I knew he'd know. Takes the whole thing and goes down. That's the picture in my mind when I was reading that thread. I'm like, y'all dangle the shark for me right out over top of the water, and you don't see me coming, but here comes the dinosaur. Going to come right out of the water with a scripture and mess up your whole thing. And I'm okay with it. (laughs) How you doing? Did we learn anything today, or did we just go too far off the rails? Amen? Why don't you stand with me this morning? (laughs) So have the, the rumors, the internet rumors of my imminent demise have been greatly exaggerated. I'm, I'm doing real good. I'm doing real good. I have no problems. So let's pray together. Father, you are a God of truth. Keep us grounded in your truth. That we would live these lives to please you and serve you, Jesus. You've earned that. You've earned it. With what you've done for us, You have earned people that are living for you. Help us. Holy Spirit, give us true discernment. Not the silly stuff, but the discernment for when our flesh is trying to lead us astray and cause us to live a whole day or a week or a month just for ourselves. And then that time is wasted because we did nothing eternal with it. Let us be people that are living for that appointment For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that we may receive of what was done in the body, whether it was good or whether it was bad. With every day, Lord, I'm either sending ahead hay and stubble or I'm sending ahead gems and precious metal. What will survive the fire is the eternal stuff, the God stuff, the Jesus stuff. So help me live my life with that day in mind. Go with each of us, God. Clothe us with your humility and your grace and your love that we might persuade men. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we would persuade men to follow you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And we give you praise today in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. God bless you. If you need anything, if you need prayer or any of that kind of stuff, please let me know. Otherwise, have a great week. Tell somebody about the Lord.
and, uh, and, and help Kathy take all those pretty flowers to her car, too. Amen. God bless.